Greetings drummers. Today we're going to look at something that I get requests for all the time. We're going to talk about in-ear monitoring. Should you use in-ear monitors? How are they used? What is it all about? Let's take There's probably nothing more misunderstood as drummers than this concept of in-ear monitoring. Now you may have heard the terms being thrown about uh, and what we're going to do today is we're going to have a look at what in-ear monitoring is uh, and how, it's all, how it all works and how it differs perhaps from the way that you're doing things now and perhaps even give you some insight on as to why you should move towards an in-ear monitoring system or whether in fact you even do need to go towards an in-ear monitoring system. Uh, before I even get started, a few people to thank. Obviously, a big thanks to the Perth Drummers community. Uh, they've put forth a bunch of questions on this topic that's allowed me a really good platform to uh, address monitoring and what it's all about. Um, if you do like this content, of course, be sure to like and subscribe. Uh, but I also want to point out another channel on YouTube. Uh, it's called Riffs, Beards and Gear. And the gentleman uh, on that particular channel um, was somebody that I looked towards. I watched a lot of his videos when I was learning to put in-ear monitoring systems together. Uh, he, he's done a great series of videos on how he came about, uh, how, he, how he arrived at his monitoring setup, um, why he bought the things that he did, the importance of planning it and all that sort of stuff. So if you haven't already, definitely go to that channel, check out those videos um, because he explains things very, very well. And he also uses some terminology like open and closed systems that we'll be getting into today. Uh, I'll probably go a little bit more in depth, um, but what I'd like to do is to make sure that you, you get an understanding really of the concepts of in-ear monitoring. So I'm not gonna worry too much about brands. Uh, it's not about brands, it's really about understanding what the whole concept is about. Uh, and to do that, we firstly need to have a little bit of a backward step and do a refresher, or perhaps this is new information to you, about a basic PA system and, and what all the components of a PA system do. It's important to understand that signal flow so that when we move to talking about in-ear monitoring, you know why it's there in the first place. Okay, so if you're not aware, when we get on stage, most of the instruments at venues are going to be mic'd up. Okay, and especially vocals, but often drums as well. And what will happen is we're gonna get a series of microphones, kick drums, snare drum, toms, potentially overheads, vocalists, guitarists, bass players, keyboardists, is all going to be plugged in, microphoned up, but though each microphone or each channel, let's call them, is going to be sent to the mixing desk, which is a board, uh, digital or analog, which all of the microphones will be plugged into, and then you'll have a sound engineer or a mixing engineer whose job it is to mix or balance all of those different signals that are coming in, your kick, your snare, your toms, guitars, bass, mix it all together to get a satisfying blend of all of those sounds in regards to volume and, and, you know, and shape of the sound, and to send all of that as one signal out to the audience. And that's done via the main outputs on a mixing desk, which we call the main left and main right, or the main outputs. So the microphones on stage are inputted or inputs for the mixing desk. The mixing occurs within that desk and then the mixed sound is output to these main front of house speakers which face the audience. So hopefully that's clear. Now, the reason I bring this up is in addition to our main outputs, most mixing desks also incorporate auxiliary or secondary outputs which can feed more speakers. Okay, why is that important? Well, because those more speakers are typically the speakers that we see as musicians on stage when we perform. And you'd probably already know that when we fire up those speakers, what we want to hear through those speakers is absolutely different to what the audience wants to hear. While the audience wants a nice balance of everybody, if you're a vocalist on stage, you want your speaker to have more vocals in it so that you can hear yourself, right? So it's important that these auxiliary outputs or these extra speakers that are sent out of this mixing desk are able to have their own specific mix relevant to the person that's listening to them. Why is this important for drummers? Well, because as drummers, we usually have one of those speakers facing us when we set up. So if you've ever got to a venue, you know that we normally have what we call a drum fill or sometimes called a fold back or a wedge or a monitor. Uh, it's usually quite large and it sits typically over by our hi-hat side if we're a right-handed player. And 
What that allows us to do is to talk to the sound guy and tell him what we want to hear coming out of that speaker when we perform. Now bear in mind, the number one role of the sound engineer is to mix a nice blend of all of these channels so that the audience can get the best possible representation of what your band is all about. That's his primary role. You're now asking him for something different in your mix. And while he might be quite prepared to do that while you're setting up, once the band starts, it becomes difficult for you to firstly get his attention because he's focused on the audience mix, but also to tell him what you want because there's noise on stage now. Now also, he can't even hear your speaker from where he is. He might be out the front of the venue somewhere. So it gets difficult to convey what you want and what you need when you've got a big speaker next to you and no means of adjusting any of that stuff yourself. So in the typical system, speakers on stage are very loud. They often don't give you everything that you want. And when you don't hear what you want, the first instinct is to start playing louder, which means you're gonna play worse. You're gonna start feeling stiff. Um, the guitarist is then gonna turn up his guitar amp because he's not hearing himself well because you're playing louder. Now the vocalist wants to come up because the guitars are drowning him out. Now in the process, what we get is this volume war on stage where everybody's turning up to hear themselves. And part of the problem with that is that everybody is hearing, to some extent, everybody else's speaker. So what we want is a system where we can hear what we need to hear, yet bring the stage volume down so it's not interfering, first of all, with other people in your band and their instruments, because instruments will feed back when the volume is too loud. But also, we don't want the guitar amps being picked up through the vocal microphone. And if they're getting picked up through the vocal microphone, he can't, the sound guy can't turn the vocals up without getting more of the guitar as well because it's spilling into the microphone. So we wanna bring everything down. We want low stage volume and maximum coming back to us without uh, using massive speakers. So this is where the in-ear monitoring system comes into it. Now, when we move to in-ear monitoring, the first thing we encounter is what we would call an open system. Now with an open system, what we mean is it's open in the sense that the sound engineer, the guy who's mixing, still has complete control and visibility over your mix. So even though you've got your own little in-ear monitors now, you still can't control anything other than the volume of what you're hearing. If you want more guitar, bass, whatever it may be, you still need to get his attention and he still needs to, to adjust that for you. What we do when we move towards an open system is we replace effectively replace the speaker that we normally have next to us with speakers that we put in our ears. So a basic open system or a basic in-ear monitoring system would consist of a few components. First of all, you need some uh, ear pieces. Okay, so this is what you're gonna be hearing with. Now these can come in a range of different types, uh, a range of different qualities, obviously. You can get some reasonably cheap ones for about $100. Uh, the Shure SE215s are a very popular option. Uh, but what this allows you to do is to stick some things into your ears, okay, much the same as if you're listening to with earphones on, on your iPhone or whatever you might be using. Uh, and you could, of course, use over-ear headphones as well. They look a bit silly on stage, perhaps, but the option is there. These are just basic earpieces, okay? And what you would do is you would plug them into a body pack. Now, currently, I'm using the Behringer P1, which you can see here which has a couple of different inputs there, uh, and I have control over the volume, I have a volume and I have a balance control. Uh, now this does two things. Not only does it allow the uh, sound engineer to send me a, an XLR cable, which has got the, the mix in it, or the signal, okay, so I clip this on my belt, plug in the signal, all of a sudden I can hear what he's mixing and sending me through one of those auxiliary outputs we talked about, uh, and I can start telling him what I wanna hear in this. But the other thing that it does is it acts as a power amplifier. When a signal comes out of a mixing desk, let's say through one of the auxiliary outputs, there often isn't enough signal or enough energy in that signal for it to be heard just by using earphones. Uh, if you were using a speaker, what you typically have to do is to send that signal through a power amplifier first, which will boost the volume of that signal to something that is loud enough to be heard through a speaker. Okay, now when we talk about speakers, we have active speakers and passive speakers. Active speakers, and these are usually speakers that we plug into the power on the wall, that power is actually powering a power amplifier which sits inside that active speaker. But passive speakers actually have the power amplifier removed and they're run as a separate component. 
The takeaway point here is that when we remove a speaker, we also remove the power amplifier that gives us enough signal to hear this mix. So we need to use something like a body pack with either uh, a battery, which this can accommodate, or mains in my case, which acts as my power amplifier that the speaker would have had. So I plug my earpieces into the body pack, and now when I receive that signal from the sound engineer, I have more than enough volume to hear what's going on through these earpieces. All right, this is now my foldback speaker. So it's a case of literally replacing the speakers that you have on stage with speakers that you have in your ear. That's an open system. Disadvantages to an open system? Well, one of the disadvantages, of course, is that we still don't get any control over the mix that we hear in our ears. We do get control over the overall volume of it, but if the guitars are too loud, we still have to wave down the, the sound engineer and get him to adjust it, okay? Similarly, um, you know, one other problem, one other challenge we get when we go to in-ears is that once we start sticking things in our ears, we can't easily hear what's going on around us anymore. And this is a very common complaint from people who first start using in-ear monitors. They feel isolated or cut off from the gig that they're a part of. And that's a big problem because if you can't hear the cheering of the crowd, if you can't hear the, uh, the bass player and the vocalist talking about or telling everybody to flip two of your songs around or change the order, then you're not a part of that gig. And that's, it's not only demoralizing, but it's actually also very problematic because you're not able to hear instruction and what's going on. Could even be a safety issue. Uh, so when you incorporate in-ear monitors, that's one thing you need to be mindful of is that you need to find some way of still being able to hear what's going on around you. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, the other disadvantage of, uh, and it's not really a disadvantage, but it's something you need to be mindful of with in-ear mixers is that if you plan to move to an in-ear monitoring system, you need to give the sound engineer warning that you're going to be using it, right? If you're a sound engineer and you turn up, you just spend you know, 20 minutes trying to position a, a speaker for the drummer that weighs about 100 kilograms and then you turn up with your little body pack and say, oh, yeah, I don't need that, he's gonna be aggro and rightfully so. What, way, what I do in my bands is I actually have a stage plot or a stage design and I use a program called uh, Stage Plot Pro. Go and check it out, it's a very, very cool piece of software. It allows you to draw and design how your band lays out on stage, where you require power, where speakers are going to be, and importantly for this tutorial, whether you or not you will be using an in-ear monitoring system and what allowances he or she will need to make for that. So there is some preparation involved. If you're moving towards in-ear monitoring, you need to send some sort of notification to the sound engineer ahead of time, telling them that you will be using in-ear monitors and how you need to have them set up ready to, or how you need him set up ready to go for when you, when you arrive at the venue. So that's the open system. Then you may wish to move for the next kind of monitoring system, which is what we call a semi-open system. So like an open system, you still don't have control over your mix. It still requires the sound engineer to give you what you want. But with a semi-open system, you are now adding some more devices to your mix, which you will control yourself. To do this, you're going to need to purchase your own mixing desk. Now it doesn't have to be a massive 32 channel desk like the sound engineer is using. It might only consist of two channels, maybe four channels. One of the channels will be the mix that the uh, sound engineer gives you through one of his auxiliary outputs. So he gives you that XLR cable and rather than plugging it into your body pack, this time you're plugging it into your little mixing desk that you've bought with your two or three channels and channel one is now that mix. And you've got control from that desk over the overall mix and balance of that signal that the sound engineer is giving you. But in addition to that, and this is where the semi-open system differs from the open system, you may wish to plug in something else, like maybe a laptop that has click tracks. Now, because you're plugging the click tracks only into your mixing desk, it's not going front of house. It's not going to the other musicians. It's only going to you. So if this is something that only you need to hear, but you wanna have control over how loud that thing sounds relative to the mix that you're getting from the sound engineer, then you plug that into a second channel and then you now get control over the balance of those two channels. So hopefully that makes sense. And then of course, if you have something like an iPad or something, or maybe you have a digital metronome that you wanna plug in, however many devices you feel you need to have, 
you would then buy a desk that accommodates all of those inputs and off you go. You have to remember with a semi-open system, when you buy your mixing desk, if that sound signal is not going to the sound engineer, then no one in the audience is gonna hear it. So this method doesn't necessarily work if you're running, say, backing tracks with click tracks, all right? You can make it work, but it involves a little bit more, it's a little bit more complex, all right? So when we talk about a semi-open system, let's say I wanted to have control over instruments in the band. What about if I wanted to hear more kick drum? I've just explained to you that in a semi-open system, we get one channel that is our mix, and I'm completely at the mercy of the sound engineer. Does that mean that I can't have any control, you know, to perhaps make my kick drum louder if I wanted to, just for me? In actual fact, you can, but it requires a little bit of uh, ingenuity on your behalf. What you can do is, with your spare channels on your mixing desk, let's say we have one extra channel that we haven't yet used, I can take potentially any microphone that is being plugged into the main mixing desk, and I can introduce a little box which can split that signal into two. Okay, so let's take the example of a kick drum. The kick drum's microphoned up. Um, it's running to the main mixing desk. But now I come along with my little splitter box. Uh, and to give an example, I'm showing the radial, the radial branded Pro MS2. MS stands for mic splitter. And what that will do is it will take one microphone signal, in our case the kick drum, and it will split it into two independent equivalent signals. One of those signals, of course, just continues onto the main mixing desk as if it was never interrupted. The second send of that microphone, that kick drum microphone, now comes into my little mixing desk, and now all of a sudden I have individual control over that kick drum channel in addition to the main mix that the sound engineer has sent me. Two channels that I can balance and manipulate 100% under my control. Hopefully that makes sense. So we can start getting control over various things. And if I was to get a second splitter box, I could then take, for example, the snare drum microphone, plug it into that splitter box, send one of the signals to the main desk as normal, send the second signal to my little desk, and now I have a main mix from the sound engineer, a kick drum which I can control, and a snare drum which I can control. Eureka, you're thinking, all of a sudden now I can just split everything. And if I have a desk big enough, then I can just control every single signal and the sound guy can just do what he wants and it won't affect me. Yes? Well, yeah, technically you can. What's the problem? Well, typically, as I said earlier, you might have six or upwards of 16 channels or 16 microphones on a stage. If you wanna hear everything, you're buying 16 splitter boxes. This is not only expensive, but it's hopelessly inefficient. You're gonna have splitter boxes all over the floor. So if you had a need to have individual control over every instrument in your band, in addition to what the sound guy's doing, what do you do? Okay, so if that is something that is important to you, then we now move to what we call a closed system. And before we get to a closed system, I wanna talk a little bit about what you can do with these splitters. If you have an, a, a scenario where you need to split multiple signals because you wanna have control over it, obviously, as we've seen, you have to duplicate the signal. You have to take each microphone, split it into two. Give one to the sound guy, then you take that second feed. But when you have a lot of these things, it doesn't make sense to buy individual splitter boxes. You can actually buy them in a rack unit which can split multiple microphones at once. And two of those are actually sitting right over my shoulder here. So what you're looking at here is the Art S8. In my case, it's a two channel splitter. So you have eight instances or eight channels that you can plug microphones into. And for each channel, you can split to two separate equivalent channels. Which means I could plug, in this example, I could plug eight microphones into here, another eight into here, and provided I have a means of dealing with it, I could actually take 16 channels for myself and still continue those 16 channels on to the sound engineer. Advantages of doing this? Well, I think you already know. You're gonna get a lot more control over your sound in your monitors. Disadvantages of doing this? If you turn up and you start taking all of the sound engineer's microphone leads and plugging them into your splitters, he's gonna split you. 
So you need to, again, you need to plan ahead and you need to let him know that this is what's gonna happen. So when I go to a gig now and I'm using this stuff, what happens usually is that rather than the microphones being plugged into um, the main mixing desk or into a stage box, the mixing engineer knows that I'm bringing my gear. So what will happen is he will actually plug all the microphones directly into my splitters. And then from the back of that, I will give him what they call a loom or a snake which has all of those 16 channels coming out the back for him to carry on and plug into his desk as normal. What he doesn't see is that the, the duplicate splits of these, so that the, the second channel of each microphone that he's not getting is actually plugging into this thing here, which is a Behringer X32 rack. It is a mixing desk equivalent to what he's using, but just in a rack version, which makes it a lot more portable and easier for me to use. And I bring this with me to the gigs that I need it at. And this is now getting into the realm of what we call the closed system. What makes it a closed system? Well, what makes it a closed system is if I'm taking a split of everybody, all of the vocals, all of the drums, all of the guitars, bass, etc., and I'm sending them into this mixing desk, then I can actually give myself an in-ear mix from this mixing desk because each signal is, is being sent here just the same as it's being sent to the sound engineer's mixing desk. So, cut a long story short, he's taken out of the equation and doesn't need to do any mixing for any of the instruments on stage. No speakers required on stage, no mixing of any of those in-ear monitors for any of the musicians. We turn up as musicians, we have control over all of it. In fact, if the sound guy was to cut out the front of house speakers and turn his desk off completely, we'll still hear ourselves. So the advantages are many. Firstly, it doesn't matter what system you turn up to a venue and see, whether there's monitors on stage, whether they're good monitors, poor monitors, whether the front of house system is working properly or not, whether the sound engineer has enough channels to send back to you, none of that matters. Your in-ear mix is coming from your closed system. Okay, so now you have total control over who gets what and how it sounds. Other advantages are that this is a digital system, and we're gonna talk a little bit about a network in a moment, but because it's a digital system, each member of my band can actually control their mix themselves using an app on their phone. Don't even need to know how to use this thing. All that has to happen is, all, is the microphones that we are using need to be plugged into this and split first so we can get a send of everything that's going to that sound guy, or a separate send of everything, okay? now. If we get to a different venue, and there are all different microphones set up on stage, then the sound that we had set from our last gig may not be applicable or may need a tweak. But essentially, everywhere we go, every different venue we go to, irrespective of the system they have in-house, we are getting a consistent mix in our ears night after night. If you go the extra step and you actually bring your own microphones, which I'm looking at doing next, then that will be consistent every night. Right? And it actually saves the sound guy a lot of work too because of course you're bringing and setting all this stuff up ahead of, uh, ahead of time and it's all coming from you. So all he really needs to do is worry about the front of house mix and let the band do what they do. Sounds good, right? So the obvious question would be, well, why don't we all just buy closed in-ear systems? Obviously, it's the better way. We get full control. I think you understand why. The first problem, of course, is cost. It gets very, very expensive to build a closed in-ear monitoring system. To give you some comparison, if you were to buy uh, an, an open system, you're, you're just getting into the game and you wanted to purchase an in-ear monitoring open system, you would need, as I said before, a body pack which would consist of something like the Behringer P1, uh, or you could actually get the Behringer P2, which is like a single channel version of this, uh, and you can get that for around about $65 Australian. You would then need some earpieces like the Shure SE215s, which I think right now you can get for probably about $120. So you could get into an open in-ear monitoring system and be ready to go and get that speaker off stage for under $200. All right, could be a very, very good way to, to go to get yourself into the monitoring game and start playing around with, with you know, the advantages that that's going to offer you. If you wanted to move to a semi-open system, of course, it would then depend on how many extra devices you want to have control over. If you're running things like uh, a click track from a digital metronome, then obviously the digital, digital metronome itself 
there's a cost involved in purchasing that piece of equipment. Uh, maybe you want to run a laptop through it for yourself as well, where you've got to buy the laptop. So it's hard to say exactly how much an open system will cost, a semi-open system will cost you, but you still need the earpieces. So there's $129. You still need a little mixing desk. Uh, so you're going to need something like uh, the Behringer uh, Zen X502, which you can get for about $65, but you're probably not getting into a semi-open system for anything less than $200. So it's $200 and up. But by comparison, a closed system like the one that I'm building behind you, and, and it's incomplete by the way, um, you're not getting any change out of about $2,000. And often it's a hell of a lot more than that, depending on your need, okay? Now, the Behringer X32 is about $2,000. The splitters are about $550 each. So you can see straight away, even just to get signals into a mixer, you're looking at, well, that's nearly $3,000. So, uh, and we haven't even talked about the extra things that you can do once you've got your closed system ready to go. So if you don't think that there's any value in spending that much money, well, you simply don't. But you can get into monitoring for $200 or more. I just wanna go back to the closed system because uh, there are a couple of advantages, extra advantages that come with a closed system. So we've talked a little bit about being able to now reduce the stage volume because we've got rid of all those speakers on stage. Now, an open and a semi-open monitoring system will already provide you that. So you don't need to go up to a closed system to get that. Uh, but we've got now with a closed system, full control, control over the sound of every instrument in our in-ears. Every band member can get their own mix. We can save those mixes and take them with us to every gig that we go to, which is really, really cool. Uh, and, and of course that doesn't change. Um, but there are some disadvantages even still. Obviously this starts to get quite large and bulky. You may not have the room to put this on stage or to fit this in your car. You may not be on stage long enough to warrant the time that it takes to set something like this up when you get to a venue, okay? Um, you may not be the kind of person that plans well enough to be able to let the sound guy know, or maybe you just don't wanna have all that preparation if you're only getting up for a half hour gig with your original band once every four to six weeks. Okay, so uh, it's not for everybody, but for those in the pro professional circuit that want full control, it really is a great way to go. Now here's how you can actually expand the closed system to do what all the touring bands are doing. Uh, we talked a little bit about having a send for each or having an output for each musician to hear what they want to hear. With the case of the Behringer P1, like I'm using, a sound engineer or myself now will send an XLR cable into this in order to hear what it is that I want to hear. But it's a cable, it's a cord. For me as a drummer, that's not a problem because I'm sitting down, I'm not moving anyway. But you can't really imagine that a guitarist or a vocalist is gonna to be too happy to have a big box on the back of their butt with a cable dragging along the floor back to my mixing desk while they wanna jump around and cross over on stage. So cables are a bad thing for people that require, are required to move. And so what they tend to do then is they want to move to a wireless uh, in-ear monitoring system. All right, and what typically happens is a wireless system will sit in your rack, like you can see behind me, uh, and it sort of fits most rack gear. And I'm gonna use the example of the Sennheiser G4 in-ear monitoring. Um, it's quite an expensive way to go. When we start looking at wireless in-ear monitoring, what we're talking about predominantly is radio frequency, digital radio frequencies. So rather than having a box with a pre-amplifier you know, stuck on my butt, what I actually do is I look at something like the G4 system, which bolts into my rack and sends off a, a digital signal out into the field. The musicians who are using this system will then have a smaller version of a belt pack which acts as a wireless receiver. So the G4 transmits the signal, it is a transmitter, and it transmits the signal, as in the mix, wireless, wirelessly via digital radio frequency to a receiver, which is on the musician's belt, and then they can hear that mix on certain frequencies, and they then have their own mix, with the advantage of not having any cables attached to them. Now, as I said, this is an expensive way to go, but if you're touring professionally, it's really the only way to go if you have a band that's moving around on stage. Okay, so something like the G4, you can actually buy a version of the G4 which includes two belt packs because it's actually a stereo transmitter which means you can actually have two inputs and you can either 
uh, use that for one musician and give him a left and a right, so a stereo signal, or more often than not, use those two inputs independently, send one input through the G4 to one musician and then one to another, and they both get a mono signal. So you can buy a unit like that, the G4, which has two belt packs, but it's gonna cost you $1,700. In one of my bands where we have five musicians, four of them of whom are up front moving around, I need to have four wireless packs, in other words, two G4 units, which is three and a half thousand dollars straight off the pop. So it's not cheap, okay? But the advantage of a wireless system, wow, that's, it's great. You run around with a, a small belt pack, smaller than a calculator, and you're free to move around and do what you want, still having full control over everything. You can also then incorporate a network. and I touched on this earlier, but what I can do is I can actually get a router, and it could be any everyday old router. You can see that I've got one here that I bought on Gumtree for about $50. Uh, preferably you want a dual band router, so that is 2.4 gigahertz and five gigahertz, so two bands. Uh, and then using Wi-Fi, your musicians can actually connect to this thing, the same as you would connecting to your Wi-Fi at home. But everything in my in your rig is now connected to that same network and it's a private network so people in the audience can't even see it but everybody's phone connects to it and the Behringer X32 also connects to this network so they can now see this X32 and with the help of an app they can actually bring up and control their own mix by using their phone and we're all connected to the same network okay so you can see here for example that I've brought up the little app and I have full control over all of the channels behind me using, now this is actually for my send too, so this is specific to me as the drummer, this is the drummer's mix. The guitarist will have one for himself, but I'm not having to do his mix for him, okay? He can do that himself. Now in addition, I can run an iPad or some other device, and as I said before, I can actually can control the main desk remotely as well, and so that means that, uh, and you might be able to see this, when I change the fader level on here, you can see that the lights behind me, this particular, uh, channel volume is moving up and down. So I can not only control the desk remotely, but everyone can control their own auxiliary output or send or their own mix from themselves using the phone. So, wow, right, now we've taken it to another level. But it can actually go one level again, and this is the real exciting part for me. Remember, we're taking a split of every microphone that's being used on stage. The sound guy's doing his thing, don't care what he's doing, we've got our own mix. But what I can actually do from our own uh, mixing console here, for example the X32, is to take a USB and output that signal into a laptop, okay? Because this is actually an interface as well as just a, a mixing desk. And so by plugging in via USB and having the drivers, I can actually load up a DAW, a workstation, uh, in this case, I've got Reaper open, but it could be Pro Tools, it could be anything. And what I can do now by bringing this in-ear mixing rack with me is I can also now record multi-track or multi-channel real-time. And then I can take that recording home, mix it, make it sound pretty, add all my effects after the fact, and then I can release this as audio. So I can start doing live mixes on the fly using the rig that I have with me. In fact, if I was smart enough to bring a couple of microphones, uh, sorry, a couple of cameras with me, I could even film the event and superimpose that mixed sound later on. So I've actually got some really, really good video content with proper multi-channeled mixed sound that I could upload to YouTube, my channel, to use for uh, promotional content. All right, so the benefits of the in-ear rack also extend to the ability to be able to record multi-channel and to be able to manipulate that sound after the gig. All right, so a lot can be done with a closed in-ear monitoring rig. As we've said, there's a lot of cost involved in doing so, but you decide whether that's relevant to you. Do you just need to bring a body pack and a set of earpieces? Do you want to plug other devices in and move towards a semi-open system? Do you want to remove the sound engineer altogether or record your shows multi-channel or move to a more professional environment where you can take your sound with you night after night? These are primarily what will determine whether you go an open system, a semi-open system, or a fully closed system, or indeed no system at all. 
as I said before, if you have a sound engineer who knows what they're doing, or you are in control of your stage volume, or you do have good hearing protection and you don't have an issue hearing what you need to hear, or if you're only on for half an hour every three weeks, maybe even spending $200 on an in-ear monitoring system is money that you don't need to spend. So hopefully you learned something about in-ear monitoring. Um, please uh, like and subscribe if you're interested in the content that I'm, that I'm creating. Um, please come back and we do the next uh, clips and stay in touch and all that sort of stuff. Hope to see you on the next video and until then, keep playing and see you.